Have you ever thought, cool dagger, but what if I throw it instead of stabbing someone with it? Yes? How about axes? Yes? Perfect! Welcome to the attic dungeon! Whether you want to be a berserker, axe thrower, or a ninja flinging stuff with utmost precision, I'm here to help you with everything! Ah yes, throwing weapons, they hold a special place in my heart. Mind you, I'm usually not a big fan of the ranged games with bows and crossbows and the like, but a well-placed axe thrown into an orc's nervous system makes my dwarf heart tingle with glee. So of course, it's a bit of a shame that thrown weapons have so little going for them. In Dungeons & Dragons 5e, there is not a single subclass that focuses on you throwing your dagger or your axe or your hammer instead of stabbing, smashing, slicing someone up with it. Luckily, I have too much time on my hands and figured out a few easy ways to make very viable thrown weapons characters. They will probably veer a bit off what you're imagining exactly, but bear with me, this is going to be good, or at least very, very fun. Usually, I would cover any common ground that my builds have, but since they don't have any, I'm just going to dive straight into the first build. I will, of course, highlight all the relevant things we encountered starting at level 1 all the way up to level 8, as per usual. Let's get going! I forgot to do the obligatory bit where I ask you to like, subscribe, click the bell or whatever if you like what I'm doing. So here it is. If you like what I'm doing, do not hesitate to like this clip, subscribe to the channel and click the little notification bell. Huzzah! I did it! Onwards! Our first build of the day is one that humors my angry dwarf side. We're going to combine the powers of the artificer with the fighter to create a dwarf that just keeps tossing and tossing and tossing the same weapon over and over again. Again, the build comes online by third level and until then you're still going to be packing quite a punch. Mountain Dwarf will be the way to go, they are the original Angry Dwarf so let's honor that by picking them. Sure, we don't get to use any of their fancy racials because we already will be getting the proficiencies from going uh, to level 1 as a fighter, but that plus 2 in both strength and constitution will go a long, long way. At level 1, seeing as you start out as a fighter, you get to pick a fighting style and I would like you to pick the dueling fighting style. Dueling specifically mentions that as long as you're using only one one-handed weapon, you gain plus 2 damage to each damage roll of that weapon. You can still hold the shield in the other hand, you don't have to leave it open so you can go uh, axe and board and still get plus 2 damage on the axe. Using everyone's favorite point by method, we put 14 in strength, constitution and intelligence. We're going to need that to multi-class into the artificer later on. You can divide the rest as you see fit. Strength and constitution will of course get bumped up to 16 by our racial bonuses. Your starting gear should include some fancy D8 martial weapon for your first two levels and at least one throwing weapon like a hand axe or a light hammer. You'll also get a shield, as I said, the perfect companion to your dueling fighting style alongside a nice suit of heavy armor. Level 2, we pick up our first artificer level. Nothing big yet, but you do get to pick up some cantrips which you should focus completely on magical utility. We will not be needing any attacking cantrips, not even for overcoming physical resistance. We'll take care of that next level. Also, your intelligence is probably never going to go over 14, so avoid too many spells that require an attack roll or a saving throw. Focus on buffs and utility. Guidance comes to mind for cantrips, and if you want to max out the tankiness that you already receive from your fighter side, absorb elements might be a really good friend covering your um, elemental resistances a bit where your armor class is already covered by that nice suit of heavy armor and the shield that you have. I'm always a fan of Featherfall, so you could pick that one up as well, but actually Expedition's Retreat is pretty good here. What it does is that it allows you to dash by using a bonus action. 
our build is almost never going to make use of bonus actions so this is actually a decent spell to increase your speed on the battlefield without um, it's costing you any action efficiency level three ah the game is afoot now we grab our second and probably last level of artificer we get an extra spell that's fun but that's not why we're here we're here for the infusions one of my favorite class features in the entire game you get to pick up four artificial infusions and two of those will be active each time you activate them at the end of a long rest and you can pick two different ones every day the first one that you have to pick is returning weapon and you can pick whatever you want for the other three take something that enhances your defensive gear something that creates knight's magic items something that enhances a casting focus of another player there's a lot of cool stuff here like sending stones for example Pick what you want, it's all pretty good stuff. But returning weapon is the core of our entire build here. Because now that we have that one, the build is done. I'll see you next time. Just kidding, we're not done yet. But the basic idea of the entire build is summed up in this returning weapon infusion. What it does is very simple. You can slap it onto any weapon that has the throne property. So that means a hand axe. A light hammer, a javelin, take your pick, slap it on, and now watch as you throw the weapon away and it automatically returns to you after the attack. This is why I prefer a hand axe. I'm a bit scared of a javelin flying back at me and I have to catch it. Furthermore, this um, infusion also gives a plus one buff to attack and damage rolls, which is really nice because not only does it obviously buff your accuracy and your damage output, it also means that your weapon counts as a magical weapon for the purpose of overcoming resistances to physical weapons. That is really great, actually. Once you start crossing into like level 5, 6 territory, you might encounter some enemies that are resistance, uh, resistant rather or uh, invulnerable to physical damage and your throwing axe will just go straight through them. By the way, you do a proper amount of damage with that one axe because I know because we're multi-classing, we are delaying the extra attack feature on the fighter side. Um, but your hand axe right now does a D6 plus 6 damage because you got plus 2 from dueling even when you throw the weapon and you got plus 1 from the infusion. So that is a really painful axe actually it hits with the power of multiple axes and that is absolutely not shabby at all you throw the axe something gets awfully hurt and then it returns to you now while you could continue leveling as an artificer my goal here is to throw my axe as many times as i can and have it wreak havoc as much as possible on the battlefield so i continue down the path of the fighter to gain as many attacks as i can so level four, which means fighter two, gives us action surge, which gives us a nice damage boost once per rest. You can throw that axe twice in a turn. It is going to wreak even more havoc. Level five, which means our third fighter level, we get to pick a subclass. Now, if you want to be really sure that all of your attacks hit, samurai is a nice choice here. It allows you at the high levels to gain an additional attack uh, over other fighters as long as you have advantage and samurais get that very easily with their fighting spirit class feature which is also good because our flying weapon hits really hard but we do want it to hit you can also go for the battle master and add some nova damage on that flying axe by adding battle maneuvers on it but i try to tap into a new subclass each time that i build something and we do already have a very nice intelligence score to multi-class into our artificer bit so eldritch nice knight is a very snug fit here we can already cast some spells thanks to our rt levels so it's really nice to expand on this even further and it adds a lot to our bag of tricks again our intelligence score is decent but it will probably never be stellar so don't focus on things that require attack or saving throws your flying magical axe is here to deal the damage but spells like 
color spray allow you to assert a bit more control over the battlefield without depending on your intelligence score. Find familiar, always fun, giving you a reliable scout amongst others and a very fun RP nugget. Mainly remember that almost all of your spells have to come from the aberration or evocation uh, schools. One of the three spells that you learn at level three can be from any one school. We already took Absorb Element as an Artificer. If you want to complete the tanky spell set, Shield makes you crazy tanky by allowing you to add plus five to your already high armor class when you need it. Because your two Artificer levels count as one Spellcaster level and your three Eldritch Knight levels also count as one, so uh, that means you will already have two, uh, sorry, three level one spell slots to cast your actually pretty impressive arsenal of spells from. So that's a uh, night buff to the Eldritch Knight the moment that you pick him. Level six gives us an ability score increase. Finally, feel free to bump strength up to 18. There's nothing wrong with that. And there really are no feats that buff thrown weapon damage or add more utility to the concept. So pumping up your strength is actually very decent. You get another spell to pick as well. If you want some backup damage for when something has invincible armor class, you can always pick up magic missile. Again, it's not depending on your intelligence score. It always hits and it always adds the plus one to each uh, die. So it's decent for you actually. Snare is also fun because it, it requires an active check to be foiled, so if your target is unaware, you're pretty sure to hook them up. Level 7 finally gives us our extra attack. So now we toss our 1d6 plus 7 damage at this point, twice per turn with a very nice plus 8 on the attack roll, uh, and this goes up to 4 times a turn if we pop our action surge. That is a hell of a lot of reliable damage. You have other builds that Nova love over the plate or can spike really well. This build is just really good at dealing consistent damage thanks to the very strong bonuses we get from both dueling and the returning weapon. As per usual, I end my builds at the 8th level, so that gives us Fighter 6. That means another ability score increase. Popping strength immediately to 20 is very possible and very good, of course, giving you 1d6 plus 8 times 2 per turn with a plus 9 on your attack roll. That is very good. Your weapon is going to be a hell of a lot of efficient. Of course, I do really like picking up feats on fighters. There are a few feats that are always good no matter what you're playing. Alert is one. And Lucky is probably the other one. They will always help. Warcaster can actually also be a very good pickup here. So you don't have to fiddle around with weapons and shields to cast and what have you. You can just cast with the hand that's holding your shield. Um, and you might want to pick up some concentration buffs later on. So you want to hold on to those for as long as you can. If you want something fun, pick up Enlarge slash Reduce at level 10 when your fighter levels give you another free choice of spell. You can pump yourself up to large size, your weapon grows with you, and enjoy boomeranging a giant axe around that deals an additional d4 of damage as well. Way, way later, when you get level 3 spells, it might be very worth picking up haste to cast on yourself. You gain double movement speed, an additional plus 2 armor class, and one more attack. Not an entire attack action, but just one attack. But it is still very, very nice and nigh unbreakable, thanks to a very decent constitution score and the Warcaster feat and constitution proficiency from your uh, fighter levels as well. So it's going to be very hard for the DM to break haste on your uh, fightificer. Let's call him the fightificer from now on. With all that in place, let's make way for our second build today, which is a bit uh, shadier than the first, and I'll explain you why. It is actually possible to have a cool dual wield throwing guy in 5e, but it isn't that simple, and the build is a bit clunky. 
um, you could just have a fighter or a ranger with a two weapon weapon fighting fighting style and you can throw the two weapons in one turn they will both get the damage uh, two weapon fighting style also works if you're throwing the weapons but you do have to pick up the dual wielding feed because otherwise there's no way you can draw two weapons in one turn and you have to be stocked up on enough javelins throwing axes knives what have you to last you an entire fight and then at higher levels you encounter the very big problem that quite a few enemies are physically resistant and you will never have enough weapons on you that are magical to keep on fighting and throwing an entire fight long so it's doable and it will be viable-ish at lower levels but once you get into the higher levels it's going to become an issue and that is one of the main reasons why this archetype of the angry dual wield throwing weapon guy isn't doing so spiffy in the nd 5v luckily there might be a glint of hope on the horizon in the shape of a rogue unearthed arcana the reason i'm dragging you away into my uh, show today is because as i explained in my last video i very much believe that this particular ua will make it into the core box in uh, core books rather in the future because it's part of the psionic uh, subclasses apart from using an ua subclass i'll also be using a ua feat because hey if you're going into ua territory might as well go all the way and also i kind of hope this particular set of feats um, will make it into core books as well because I really like them. To make it even crazier, I am going to use a race that people around me know I really don't like to use. It's going to be an elf. <gasps> I'm going to make this rogue into an Eladrin. Why? As much as I usually don't really like elves, I really like the Eladrins for how they change each season, both in looks and in behavior. And their face step racial ability gives us a nice repositioning tool, which is always great for ranged characters. If you don't want to use an elf, and I could understand why you wouldn't want to do that, you can also use a halfling. Um, the halfling lucky racial ability is really good and will help you land sneak attack somewhat more reliably by allowing you to reroll your ones. But for today, we have our level one Eladrin Rogue. Because we won't be multi-classing and rogues really only need dexterity and a decent amount of constitution, you can dress up the other attribute scores any way you like. Of course, we're using point by and after applying my racial bonuses, I ended up with uh, 10 strength, 16 dexterity, 14 constitution, 12 intelligence, 10 wisdom and 14 charisma. This is pretty great because it means that I have no negative modifiers whatsoever. There's no saving throw that sucks or skill that is subpar. You're decent at everything. And the charisma, apart from helping you, of course, with your social skills, also gives you some free damage if your elf would happen to be uh, active during summer and teleporting around, you get to deal some damage based on your charisma. So that's another reason to pump up the charisma. At level two, of course, we get cunning action, a great tool for rogues that allows you to use your bonus action to dash, hide or disengage. Good stuff, but this will be competing with us using our bonus action to attack a second time starting next level. Because at level 3 we gain our subclass, the Soul Knife. To get the details on how the psionic talent for this subclass works, I very kindly and humbly refer you to my previous video. I covered the mechanic in depth there and it is not the focus of today's video. The Psychic Blades feature, however, is. So at level 3, whenever you attack, you can manifest a psychic blade in your hand and use it to stab people or to throw it up to 60 feet away. That is pretty damn good, that 60 feet. The hand axes I used in my uh, Fight Officer build will only reach 60 feet if you roll with disadvantage. It's a 20 feet standard range and the javelins actually have a 30 standard range up to 120 if i think so having 60 without disadvantage is really good for thrown weapons so this 
Rogue here gets a proper range throwing weapon. On hit, it deals 1d6 psychic damage plus strength or dexterity. You can choose, obviously it's going to be dexterity, but it is a finesse weapon, so you could technically choose. When you use this feature to attack, if your other hand is also free, you can use your bonus action to create a second blade that you can also attack or throw with. But this one will only deal 1d4 without dexterity modifier because it's an offhand attack. It's still good though, very good even, for a simple reason. It allows you to make two attacks at range and thus you gain an extra chance at triggering sneak attack. Dual wielding is usually the reason why uh, melee rogues do more damage than range, uh, ranged rogues on average. It's not the offhand bonus damage, it's the second chance per turn to trigger that very valuable sneak attack. If your um, rogue with a bow misses his one shot per turn, that's it, you cannot trigger sneak attack again. But if your dual short sword rogue misses his first attack, there's still a decent chance he'll get in the second blow and will still uh, trigger sneak attack. This rogue can do two ranged attacks, which is something ranged rogues could only do if they picked up the crossbow expert feat. But there it is here in this subclass, featless with decent damage and it allows you to swap between melee and ranged, ranged combat without any hassle. It truly is a very flexible and very good feature. So there you go, dual wielding throwing weapons done right. You create the shiny sword, you throw the shiny sword. Even better is that you will always have weapons on you. And when you're not attacking, your hands are empty in case you want to try something fancy like climbing on somewhere or pickpocketing pick someone in the middle of a fight, always a thing. Um, to compare damage a bit, our fight officer was doing 1d6 plus 6 damage at this point. This rogue at this level does 1d6 plus 3 plus 1d4 plus 2d6, provided you can trigger sneak attack reliably. So it has a poss uh, possible higher damage outcome. But it requires a bit of a setup, of course. On to level 4 then. I will present two options here. The first one is simple and probably the most alluring one for now. Pump up your dexterity. It does a lot for rogues. Gives you a bit more damage on your main hand attack. A bit more accuracy on both of your attacks. Your armor class goes up. Your dexterity save goes up. Dex is too valuable of a stat in 5e to the point where it's a bit sad sometimes for the other uh, attribute scores. Oh well, you're a rogue. Grab your dexterity bump. The other option is for those who want to instead focus on doing more damage with their offhand. Under the current... Uh, unearthed arcana feats there is the option of picking up a fighting style as a feat and seeing as you can uh, dual wield on demand you could easily pick up the two weapon fighting fighting style and you would be allowed to add your dexterity modifier to your d4 damage roll as well which basically makes it a lot more painful doubling the average damage output of your offhand weapon. The feat requires proficiency with at least one martial weapon, and we have that because rogues are proficient with rapiers. Uh, the wording of the feat, well, of the fighting style rather, is maybe a bit awkward for us though. It says that when you engage into weapon fighting, you get to add the damage. It is never literally said that we do that. Um, we don't use our bonus action to activate two-weapon fighting. We use it through our class feature to activate the second soul blade to attack with. But still, I think we can agree that this rogue is engaging in two-weapon fighting without literally activating a set uh, feature. Uh, rules as, is, as intended, am I right? Whatever you pick up here, pick up the other one at level 8, alright? So, level 5 gives you Uncanny Dodge, which allows you to use your reaction to halve any damage you suffer from one attack. Pretty good, really. You shouldn't um, be getting hit too much as a ranged rogue, so when you do, you might as well use your reaction to halve the damage. Your other option is, of course, when you can, to use your reaction to attack someone, the attack of opportunity, because that does allow you to trigger sneak attack again if possible. Don't forget that. It's really important as a rogue. Level 6, more expertise to up your skill monkey factor. Level 7, 
makes your dexterity saving throws truly the best dodgy thing in town. Whenever you roll a dexterity save, if you fail the save, you still only take half damage. And when you succeed, you take no damage whatsoever. Eat that fireball. And of course, as I said, at level 8, we crown our build by grabbing whatever feature you didn't get at level 4. If you're not doing the UA feats, of course, you max out your dexterity here already. So, our damage per turn at level 8 is a potential 1d6 plus 4, plus 1d4, plus 4, plus 4d6 in sneak attack. In comparison to the fight officer, that does 2 times 2d6 plus 14 though. Um, and once per short rest, he can go for uh, 4d6 plus uh, 28, that would be. Uh, so the rogue damage is going to be a bit more spiky, but potentially higher than the fight officer, uh, which has a very nice and stable damage at this level and has a slightly higher hit chance because he has the magical weapon in any case. Your rogue, uh, the thing is your psychic blades count for overcoming magical resistances, but they don't get any plus one bonuses. And for now, there is no way to upgrade those blades to a higher damage um, die or whatever. So we have to deal with that fact though. So pick what you want, dual psychic lasers or throwing hammers around like your Thor himself, whatever you pick, I'm sure you can have a blast with these builds, showing people that throwing weapons are not going out of fashion just yet. I hope to see you next time in the Attic Dungeon.